So if you made it this far, you are awesome. Thank you so much for being interested in learning the instruction manual to having a healthy, happy life. One where you are at peace with God and at peace with your neighbor. And as a reminder, there are not 613 commandments. That is what the rabbis made up. And the things that have been removed from this list is anything dealing with the temple, the land of Israel specifically, and anything dealing with slavery. That is biblical slavery, which is a lot different than what we think of as slavery. So all that's left is all the commandments that apply to the average person. So we leave off at 215. And that is in Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. It's dealing with the Canaanites' mourning ritual. This is for dead people. In which it states, You are the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves nor shave the front of your head for the dead. And so what you had was when someone died in the Canaanite culture, you were to either rip the hair out of the sides of your beard or rip your hair out of your head, or you would cut your hair, shave your beard, and you would cut yourselves or do tattoos in remembrance for the dead, in mourning for the dead. So as long as you aren't doing these things for the dead, you won't be violating this commandment. This commandment doesn't mean that you are not to be bald, by no means. As long as you're not doing it for a dead person, you can be bald. Number 216, Deuteronomy 14, verse 3. Not to eat unclean, abominable things, which the verse states, you shall not eat any abominable thing. I don't think there's any confusion here. Go and look up abominable things. Now don't eat those. 217, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 4. And we need 5 for the context. This is eating habits. In which it states, These are the animals which you may eat. The oxen, the sheep, the goat. And then verse 5, it continues, The deer, the gazelle, the roe deer, the wild goat, the mountain goat, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. These are all grazers. They're clean animals. They eat grass. They eat foliage. And so they're not going to be full of diseases, worms, etc., etc. That is what unclean animals do. They go around eating up garbage in the environment and they suck up toxins. And so God knows this and he has figured this all out and what we're not to do is be eating the garbage disposals of the environment because those toxins will be passed on to you. So God's got clear reasons why he wants you to eat certain animals and why he doesn't want you to eat other animals. Number 218, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 6, eating animals again, in which it states, and you may eat every animal with cloven hooves, having the hoof split in two parts, and that choose the cud among the animals. So these are like cows and deer and stuff. So if it has a split hoof and it chews the cud, you can eat it because it's going to be clean. Number 219. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 7. And this is dealing with not to eat any unclean animal. See, we're getting these clean and unclean descriptions while they're in the desert. However, the clean and unclean issue does not start with the people at the base of Mount Sinai. It actually starts back at creation. God created the clean and unclean from the very beginning. And you can also see it 
when Noah is taking on animals into the ark, he is taking on more clean animals than he is for the unclean animals. So this is not a new thing. This started at the very beginning. And also it's important to remember that Adam and Eve ate something that they weren't supposed to eat. So that's how we got into this mess. Someone ate something that they weren't supposed to eat. Should you be questioning what your eating habits are? I would like to be in step with God on that matter. In which this verse states, Nevertheless, these you shall not eat of them that chew the cud or of them that divideth the cloven hoof as the camel, the hare, and the coney. For they chew the cud, but divide not the hoof. Therefore, they are unclean unto you. Number 220, Deuteronomy 14, verse 8. Pork is not food. See, the Bible specifically describes what is food, good for food, and what is not. And so when the Bible uses the word food, it is only in the context of what is clean. You cannot call pork a food. The Bible has already said what is food and what is not. In which this verse states, also the swine is unclean for you because it has cloven hoofs, yet does not chew the cud. You shall not eat their flesh, nor touch their dead carcasses. There's a whole host of scientific reasons on why you should not eat pork. Pigs do not sweat, so when they eat toxins in the environment, it accumulates in their fat cells, and when you cook them, the toxins come out in the meat. And so that's why you get high cholesterol and you get high blood pressure after eating pork. There's also a lot of worms in pork. Pigs are quick to turn cannibalistic. They also eat their own feces. So they are not clean by any stretch of the imagination. And God is trying to protect you from that because with a very unclean animal rotting, it's going to have a lot of diseases and therefore you should not touch the carcass. Number 221, Deuteronomy 14, verse 9. Clean fish are food. In which the verse states, These you may eat of all that are in the waters. You may eat all that have fins and scales. And see, this reminds me of a military study in which they were trying to figure out how do we teach our military personnel if they get caught out in the middle of nowhere and they need to survive what is a good scale or measure for them to figure out if a fish is clean or not enough to eat and it still came down to fins and scales and so they ended up just saying fins and scales eat the fish if it doesn't have it don't eat it so they could have just opened their Bibles and saved their time doing all that research. Number 222, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 10. And this one is dealing with fish that are not food. In which it states, And whatever does not have fins and scales you shall not eat is unclean for you. And so... I'm actually a fisherman and I do a lot of fishing and I really enjoy catching catfish. However, catfish do not have scales. Catfish are bottom feeders. They swim at the bottom and they collect all the toxins. And I can't tell you how many fish that I've caught that had sores and weird stuff all on them. And I'm sure they're accumulating mercury and whatever other toxins that are sitting on the bottom of the water so that's why we're not to be eating them because you're essentially poisoning yourself 223 deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 11 searching for the prescribed signs in birds for eating 
in which it states, of all the clean birds you shall eat. Pretty simple. If it's a predator bird, don't eat it. If it's a scavenger bird, don't eat it. If it pecks the ground for grain or for food, it is clean. Number 224, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 12. And we're going to need 13 through 18 to continue out this whole thought. And this is dealing with unclean, not edible birds, which it states, But these you shall not eat, the eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the red kite, the falcon, and the kite after their kinds, every raven after its kind, the owl. And so I want to pause right there because some of your Bible translations will put ostrich. And it's not ostrich, it's owl. The Hebrew word means owl. And there's actually a Hebrew translation issue going on there, but I'm not going to get into it. The ostrich is not unclean. Continuing on, this short-haired owl, the seagull, and the hawk after its kind, the little owl, the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw, the carrion vulture, the fisher owl, the stork, the heron, after its kind, and the hoopoe, and the bat. So basically, if it's a scavenger or predator flying creature, you're not to eat it because it is going to be unhealthy. It's going to be full of toxins, and it's also going to taste disgusting. I once heard from someone who ate some buzzard meat, and they said it tasted like eating garbage. And so it's going to taste like the things that it eats. Number 225, Deuteronomy 14, verse 19. Not to eat any creeping winged, either bat or insect, in which it states, And every creeping thing that flies is unclean unto you, they shall not be eaten. Number 226, Deuteronomy 14, verse 21. Not to eat any animal which dies naturally. In which it states, you shall not eat anything that dies of itself. You may give it to the alien who is within your gates that he may eat it. Or you may sell it to the foreigner. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. So there's two things in this verse. One, if an animal dies naturally or dies in a tragic accident with another animal and you weren't there and you find it, you're not to eat it. But God says those poor people that are strangers that have come into your land, you can go give it to them or you could sell it to them and let them eat it. I don't think you should because the meat might be rancid, but it's an option according to God. The other thing is, it's just reiterating a Canaanite ritual of fertility. You boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And so this verse is stating that you are not to do that. And we've covered those verses previously. Number 227, Deuteronomy 14, verse 29. Take care of the Levites, the strangers, the fatherless, and the widow. In which it states, And the Levite, because he has no portion of inheritance with you, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow, which are within your gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied, that Jehovah your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. So, we are to take care of the stranger. We are to take care of the fatherless and the widow. God has built in a welfare system in which we help them out. 
Number 228, Deuteronomy 16, verse 1, the month of the Aviv. Now, this one is very important because we are to guard the month of the Aviv. We are to protect it. And many people don't even know what the month of the Aviv is. When you go and look at Project Truth Beam's video on God's calendar, the Creator's calendar, you will learn all about the month of the Aviv. In the English, they translate it a little funny, but you can see the month of the Aviv throughout the Bible. You can see the calendar that Jesus was on when he was here on the earth. And that was the creator's calendar described in the Bible. And the month of the Aviv is in the spring. It is two weeks before the barley is ripened and it is started on the spotting of the first sliver of the new moon. Now the rabbis will have you to believe that the head of the year, the start of the year, is on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is not start of the year. Rosh Hashanah was created. It was a carryover from Babylon where they had seasonal starts and Rosh Hashanah was created to cover up the Feast of Trumpets. The Bible describes the Feast of Trumpets. However, the Jewish people today do not celebrate the Feast of Trumpets. Because the Feast of Trumpets, you have to do the spotting of the new moon and you have to blow the trumpets from the Temple Mount. So on that day, they actually celebrate Rosh Hashanah. The Feast of Trumpets also has a caveat with it that nobody knows the day or the hour of the Feast of Trumpets. Now, if that is sounding familiar to you, that is because you are remembering what Jesus said. He said, no one knows the day of the hour of the return of Christ. So I think there is a parallel there or a little secret message that Christ is going to return on the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets starts on the spotting of the new moon and it takes two witnesses. No one knows the day or the hour of the spotting of the new moon for the Feast of Trumpets. Now let's get into the verse. It says in 16.1, Observe the month of the Aviv and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For the month of the Aviv, the Lord your God brought you out of the land of Egypt by night. So how many people out there are observing the month of the Aviv? Number 229, Deuteronomy 16, verse 18. And this is appointing judges and officers, in which it states, Judges and officers shall you make you in all of your gates, which Jehovah your God gives you throughout your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. So you are to make judges from your own people, and you are to have correct judgments. You're not to have corrupt judges. Number 230, Deuteronomy 16, verse 19. Perverting justice. This is continuing on with what a judge needs to have. And in which it states, You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. So we're not to take bribes. And judges are not to take bribes. We're supposed to have fair, equal justice. Number 231, Deuteronomy 16, verse 21. Idol worship with trees and wooden statues. In which it states, You shall not plant yourself any tree or wooden image near the altar which you Build for yourself to the Lord your God. Now, we're not building altars, but this is coinciding with idol worship and what people were doing for idol worship. And so we're not to plant specific trees to worship around. And I would stretch that out to putting trees in your house for 
some ritual, tradition, or some sort of practice and claiming you're doing it for God or a God or any type of gods out there that are fake gods. And you're not to put up wooden images of creatures and the purpose that you're going to do some sort of ceremony, ritual, or tradition and say you're doing it for God. God is not going to be pleased with that. So if anything strikes your mind that you're doing that's similar to these things, I would say you might want to reevaluate those things. Number 232, Deuteronomy 16, verse 22, which is dealing with not to erect any image which people worship, which is states, neither shall you set up any image which Jehovah your God hates. Pretty clear. And he's already told us all the things that he hates. And so we're not to put up anything that represents those things. Number 233, Deuteronomy 17, verse 9. Witnesses required. Bible's pretty clear. You have to have some witnesses if you're going to make a judgment. Which it states, whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. So, this is very important because circumstantial evidence does not work. You have to have witnesses to execute the death penalty. That is what God has said. Sometimes you only have one witness. Well, you can't continue on. You have to have two witnesses or three. Number 234, Deuteronomy 17, verse 7, putting out evil, which it states, the hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death. And after the hands of all the people, so you shall put away the evil from among you. So this is dealing with after you've executed someone who is guilty of a death penalty, then you are to go and continue on seeking out the evil from among you and you are to remove the evil. My question is, why is there so much evil in this land? Because people are not seeking it out and dealing with it. All evil needs is for good men to stand by and do nothing. Number 235, Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 through 11. And this is dealing with not practicing soothsaying, enchanting, sorcery, or consulting with necromancers. In which this verse states, There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That means uh, a Canaanite or Molech ritual where they jump through fire or they pass their baby through fire or sometimes they will actually burn their children. Child sacrifice. Continuing on. Or that uses divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. That is the person who talks to the dead or can raise the dead. So, we're not to have any of those people because they're evil, and they are basically of Satan. They're doing the work of Satan. They're causing confusion. They're playing with demons and fallen angels. And so these people are not to be found among us. Number 236, Deuteronomy 18, verse 13, be blameless. In which God is saying, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. Abraham was told to be blameless. That means to be righteous, to be without fault. We are called to be righteous. And how do we be righteous? We follow God's commandments. We do exactly what he says to do. We don't stray to the left or right. We stay on the path. Number 237, Deuteronomy 18, verse 20. 
And this is dealing with falsely prophesying for God and not to prophesy in the name of idols. Very important verse because there's a lot of people out there claiming to be prophets and making all these crazy predictions. And then when they get it wrong, they just continue on making more predictions. We need to turn our backs on those people. Those people are false prophets. Well, the Bible says here, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Now, we can't execute that judgment, but a false prophet that is prophesying in the name of God, he will die. And on judgment day, he will get cast into the lake of fire. So he will surely die according to this verse. He's been found guilty, violating the processes of God, and also lying. This is a very serious charge. And so all these people who say they're prophets, in the Old Testament, it was a very rough thing to be a prophet. Many prophets were killed, and they were mistreated and had terrible lives. And they walked according to the Torah, keeping the commandments. And when they prophesied, they prophesied using God's name. How many people out there that are prophets are doing those things? That is a good question. Number 238, Deuteronomy 18, verse 22. And this is dealing with false prophesying and using God's name. Again, we're continuing on getting more information on these false prophets, in which it states, when a prophet speaks the name of the Lord, that's Jehovah, Jehovah in English, if the thing does not happen or comes to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. So they've spoken from their own hip, their own mind, in which it states, you shall not be afraid of him. So if it's a false prophet and they're working people up and they're saying things and it does happen or it doesn't happen, either way, you're not to be afraid. Number 239, Deuteronomy 19, verse 13, and this is dealing with judge not to pity one who killed or caused loss of limb. So we're not to be pitying people that have suffered unfortunate situations, in which it states, Your eye shall not pity him, but you shall put away the guilt of the innocent blood from Israel, that it may go well with you. So we talked about the city of refuge. I think that many places should do that or people should move away. There has been a sad, tragic accident. Number 240, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. And this is dealing with not convicting on the testimony of a single witness. We've already seen that similar verse talking about this. And we're getting more detail each time. And this one, it states, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sins at the mouth of two witnesses or the mouth of three witnesses shall a matter be established. So you can't just go around accusing people. You actually have to have another witness with you and you have to have testimony and you have to be telling the truth. Not to slander, you're not to make up stories. If someone is doing wrong, you need to have two people see it, and then they can deal with the situation. Number 241, Deuteronomy 1919, and is dealing with false witnesses punished as they intended upon 
accused. Which is that then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. So you shall put away the evil from among you. And so if you stand to lose everything that you accuse someone else of, then you will not come forward with lies because it's a serious charge. You could yourself lose everything. Number 242, Deuteronomy 19, verse 21, equal justice. God is fair, which it states, your eye shall not pity. Life shall be for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. This is all equal justice or the price of what it would be. And so if uh, I accidentally crushed a man's hand, well, I'm going to give him fair value for what his hand would have been worth. And don't ask me what that price is, but we are to have equality in our returns, giving back to someone to be punished according to equal justice. Number 243, Deuteronomy 21, and we need verse 15 to get the context for verse 16. And this is dealing with firstborn regardless of wife. This is a very important one because a very famous person named Abraham, he did not do what was right for his firstborn. In which this verse states in verse 15, if a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and they have borne him children, both the loved and unloved, and if the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, then it shall be on the day he bequeaths his possessions to his sons that he must not bestow firstborn status on the son that is loved, the son of the loved wife in preference to the son of the unloved the true firstborn. So, firstborn is firstborn. It doesn't matter if you don't really like that wife or you don't really like that son. You cannot do that. That is not good. That's not fair. And God is making a declaration here. Firstborn son, they get double portion. Number 244, Deuteronomy 21, verse 17 acknowledging the firstborn of the unloved wife in which it states but he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has for he is the beginning of his strength his offspring the right of the firstborn is his so doesn't matter you cannot say that's not my child. I'm not going to take care of him. I'm not I'm going to neglect him even though the DNA says that you're the daddy. You can't just go off and say I'm not acknowledging him. God is putting that rule in place. Acknowledge all your children, take care of them and bless your children. Number 245 Deuteronomy 21 verse 20 no eating or drinking in excess that is gluttony and drunkenness in which this verse states and they shall say unto the elders of the city our son is stubborn and rebellious he will not obey our voice he is a glutton and a drunkard so it is not to be of the people that anybody should be a glutton or a drunkard or rebellious or stubborn in this case, there is a grown son who is going crazy and not listening. And so they're supposed to take them to the elders of the city to figure out what to do with them. Number 246, Deuteronomy 21, verse 22. And this is dealing with hang after execution. This is after the death penalty violators of, the, of certain commandments. 
if someone is deemed worthy of death. And which this verse states, if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and you hang him on a tree, he is not to stay there. You're not to leave him there. Hanging. You're to execute the death penalty if someone is guilty of death. And we need the next one to tell us more about why we don't leave them. Number 247, Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, on burial on the same day of execution, which states, His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but you shall in any way bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that your land be not defiled, which Jehovah your God gives to you for an inheritance. And that is kind of touching on the land of Israel. But basically, if someone is put to death, you are to go ahead and get them down. And don't leave them just laying around, rotting for everyone to see. You are to bury them right away all right and that concludes part eight of our series in learning god's instructions i hope this has been a informative and blessing to you and i hope that you can pass this on please like subscribe hit the notification lee enjoys getting comments i hope you can join us in the next one in which we are getting that much more closer to finding out the final number of commandments that apply to the average person today. Thank you so much and God bless.